Welcome to Voice of the Vatican, our top stories. Marching for Life. Thousands marched through the heart of Rome with song, banners, and prayer to express support for protecting God's precious gift of life. Honoring Pope Benedict XVI, a new center opens in England's largest Catholic university to carry forth the ideals and thought of this great pontiff. Miss USA finds Christ. The 2010 pageant winner, who was the first Muslim to hold the title, has become a Catholic. Doctors Aiding Africa. Pope Francis hosts a special audience for those offering health care services in Africa to the Italian organization Kua. Christian protests in China. A group, including a Catholic cardinal, march in Hong Kong to protest the widespread removal of crucifixes in mainland China. Dialogue in Action. Muslim neighbors work together to rebuild two destroyed Catholic churches in a Pakistan village. Prayers amidst flames. Pope Francis expresses his closeness to the victims of the Alberta, Canada fire, and the evacuated Catholic community gathers to celebrate the Holy Mass. Diplomatic relations. The ambassador of Japan to the Holy See gives Pope Francis an unusual gift with a symbolic meaning. And finally, Pentecost preparation. We'll go to the Divine Retreat Center in Kerala, India for a special message in time for the Feast of the Descent of the Holy Spirit. I'm Ashley Narona in Rome, Italy, and you're watching Voice of the Vatican only on Shalom World TV. Upwards of 30,000 people marched through the streets of Rome this week to celebrate the joy of life. It was the sixth annual March for Life, and more than 100 pro-life and pro-family organizations from 30 countries turned out for the event in a celebration of God's gift of life. I think many of us have forgotten that life is a gift. Um, we, we go through the day each day doing what we need to do to get to the end of the day and and we don't stop to think that it's a gift and and this also manifests itself in the various consequences such as abortion or you know life has become something disposable in many ways and so i, I come to give testimony to the joy and to the gift of life the staging for the event took place at the ancient bocca della verità that means the mouth of truth and sharing the truth is what the day was all about we are here to defend something that should be obvious, and that was obvious for centuries, the right to live. Although, sadly, in the last years throughout the world, there has been an ideology that's grown, which many call the ideology of death, because it's against life and against every aspect of dignity of the human person. We are here to stand up for the truth and to help people know the way to truth and happiness. In Italy, which calls itself a Catholic country, sadly, abortion has been legal since 1978, within the first 90 days of pregnancy. This culture of death is detrimental to women, even though, sadly, many do not realize that fact until it's too late. The mother is the center of the family. That's why we say matrimony from the word mother. Motherhood today has been degraded, has been insulted, has been uh, belittled. And the women in general are the ones who suffer the most with pornography, with uh, sexual abuse, with prostitution, with contraception, with chemical contraception. And our mission in our society is to uh, defend the rights of the family, especially of the woman and of her child. It is amazing to see how uh, in our days when uh, human rights are proclaimed all over the world, rights to... Uh, homosexual lifestyles, rights to this, rights to that, and the most basic right of every human being, the right to be alive, the right of the innocent not to be murdered, a most fundamental basic right. And here in Italy, a supposedly Catholic country, where this right is not respected. Participants in the march prayed together and sang hymns, knowing that the true way to conversion of hearts can only be through the power of prayer. 
And so we're gonna we're gonna pray. We're gonna we're gonna scream. <laughs> we're gonna scream and uh, to show our happiness. The Catholic is is not sad people. Catholic are happy people because we have uh, uh, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that help us. The Holy Virgin Mary helps us. The saint help. But we have to pray for all over the world. The march culminated in St. Peter's Square, where the Holy Father welcomed the participants after the recitation of the Regina Chaley prayer. The work must continue long after the march finishes, since the fight for life is ongoing. We have to be Christians everywhere, in the school, in the street, uh, in the sports, uh, in the work, uh, because Jesus Christ is everywhere, and the Holy Spirit is everywhere. Thank you, Father, for reminding us that we are indeed called to represent the face of Christ always and everywhere, especially during this Jubilee Year of Mercy. It's the largest Catholic university in England, and it's named after Our Lady. St. Mary's University Twickenham became worldwide known in September of 2010 when Pope Benedict XVI visited the hallowed halls during his historic visit to England. In commemoration of that important event, the university this week opened a new interdisciplinary educational center named after the former pontiff. The Benedict XVI Center is an international hub for research in the subjects of religion, economics, sociology, and political science, and is based on the thoughts and ideals of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict XVI. The official launch ceremony this week was held in the very room from which Pope Benedict delivered an address to religious leaders during his official state visit in 2010. Pope Benedict XVI has for many years engaged the themes of theology, ethics, and society, and spoken about the necessity of Christians to help renew Western civilization from within. It's expected to take the next few decades for theologians to unpack the profundity of the vast writings of Cardinal Ratzinger, not only for Catholics, but for all Christians. We pray this new center will provide a way to share Pope Benedict's theological gift of wisdom as a leaven through which the glory of Christ, the Church, and the truth can be dispersed throughout the world. The first Muslim to win the title of Miss USA when she was crowned in 2010 has converted to the Catholic faith. Rima Feiki will be married on May 15th in Bakirk, Lebanon to Wasim Salibi, a successful music producer who's a Maronite Catholic. Faki was a Shiite Muslim born in Lebanon and attended St. Rita's Catholic School near Beirut. When her family moved to New York to escape the devastation of the Lebanese Civil War, she attended a Catholic school there as well. It was later that she connected with her Muslim roots and faith while attending the University of Michigan in Dearborn and became involved with Muslim groups, learning more about the Shiite religion. Nevertheless, Christ came into Faki's life and she recently tweeted Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through him who strengthens me. After news of her conversion surfaced, members of the Muslim community flooded Faki's online pages with negative reactions to her upcoming marriage. We commend her for her bravery to proclaim Christ, who indeed strengthens her throughout her new journey in the faith. As Christ said in Matthew 10:32, everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly Father. Pope Francis held a special audience at the Paul VI Hall here in Rome, gathering doctors and healthcare experts who are working with an organization called Doctors with Africa, CUAM. The name CUAM is an acronym for the Italian words for International College for Health Cooperation in Developing Countries. It was the first NGO in the field of healthcare to be officially recognized in Italy and aims to gather and train Italian and overseas medical students who want to devote a period of their professional lives to the service of missionary hospitals in developing countries. Born in 1950 in the Diocese of Padova, Italy, under the guidance of a missionary physician named Francesco Canova, who worked in Jordan, along with Bishop Girolamo Bortignon, it took as its motto the evangelical instruction, Ayuntes Curante Infermos, which means go and care for the sick. Over these past 60 years, it has become the leading Italian organization engaged in missionary work in sub-Saharan Africa and has sent out more than 1,500 healthcare workers to 217 hospitals. 
More than 8,000 Kuam supporters, doctors, volunteers, medical staff, and benefactors gathered right here in Rome and were received by the Holy Father to celebrate Kuam's 65 years of missionary activity. In the wake of these great witnesses of missionary and evangelically fruitful closeness, you carry on your work with courage, giving expression to a church that is not a clinic exclusively for super A-list VIPs, but rather a field hospital, a church with a great heart, close to the many wounded and humiliated of history, to the poorest of the poor. We spoke to Andrea Azzori of Kuam, who, after working in Africa for eight years, said the experience of the audience with the Holy Father was nothing short of inspirational. It was great to hear from the Holy Father how close he is to our work and the style we have in Africa. The name Doctors with Africa is because we believe we have to work with Africa. And that means with African population, African professionals, African institutions. We don't want to create any parallel system. We work to work inside what is already owned by the local people. So that was the first message. The second message is to keep going the last mile, as he said. The last mile are the most vulnerable population, are the poorest of the poor, are the people that are not assessing any services at all. So this is a big challenge, but we are ready for this challenge. It's a corporal work of mercy to care for the sick, and we commend Kuam and all of those engaged in the healthcare ministry for responding to that call and reminding us that we can all make a difference by performing the corporal works of mercy in our own homes, neighborhoods, or even in another country. Cardinal Joseph Zen was among more than 50 Christians who attended a protest in Hong Kong against violations of religious freedom in mainland China. The participants marched to the Beijing Liaison Office to protest that Chinese authorities have forcibly taken down crosses for more than 2,000 churches in Zhejiang in the last two years. Attendees represented various organizations, including the Hong Kong Christian Institute, Christian Social Concern Fellowship, the Catholic Commission for Justice and Peace in Hong Kong, and Christians for Hong Kong Society. Demonstrators laid down flowers to honor the memory of those who have died fighting for religious liberty in China. Cardinal Zen, the 84-year-old Catholic prelate and former Hong Kong bishop, who's long symbolized the struggle between the authentic and state-sanctioned church and communist China, spoke during the protest, asking people not to sit by and watch silently. We can't just watch on the side. If we don't speak out, we are the accomplices. We want the country's leadership to seriously look into the barbaric actions used to breach religious freedom and to guarantee the rights of citizens to personal safety and to give back respect to worshipers. The protest comes soon after a controversial speech given by President Xi Jinping in which he emphasized the superiority of the Communist Party over religious groups. We pray for Cardinal Zen and thank him for being a true example of what it means to be a successor of the Apostles, to boldly proclaim Christ at a tremendous risk to his own freedom and even to his own life. We hear a lot about the need for interreligious dialogue, but in two villages in Pakistan, we actually have the chance to see it being lived out. We continue to pray for the Christians who are suffering as minorities in Pakistan, but are happy to report two stories that bring a glimmer of hope. In the Punjab province, in the small village of Khalsabad, people of different faiths are pitching in to help their neighbors in need. In that village, monsoons washed away the only Catholic chapel. It was a mud hut and served the eight Christian families living in the village. In their helplessness, they looked to their Muslim neighbors and a local Muslim shopkeeper answered that cry for help, donating 10,000 rupees, approximately 150 U.S. dollars, to aid the project. Construction has begun, and so far the boundary walls have been erected. The effort has been bolstered by a local businessman who donated an additional 30,000 rupees. And something similar is happening near Gojra, Pakistan. In 2009, a Muslim mob destroyed five churches following accusations of blasphemy. Ten Christians were killed during the incident, including seven who were burnt alive in their homes. Muslim businessmen and farmers have now teamed up with local Christians in a plan to rebuild. 
Through these efforts, we are reminded to continually reach out to our neighbors, always with a true Christian spirit, realizing that God's grace touches people of all faiths. The Holy Father met with the ambassador of Japan to the Holy See, Yoshio Matthew Nakumara, who presented Pope Francis with his credentials. Japan was the first non-Christian state to establish diplomatic relations with the Holy See in 1942. The ambassador then gave Pope Francis an unusual gift, a set of binoculars. The ambassador explained the binoculars were so the Holy Father could, quote, see the lives of the people in the periphery. This symbolic gift reminds us to always have our spiritual binoculars ready so we can keep our sights focused always on Christ. Amidst the flames and destruction, Pope Francis has reached out to the victims of the horrific fire raging in the northern Canadian region of Alberta and expressed his closeness and prayers. A letter to the local bishops sent by Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Perellin on the behalf of the Holy Father reads, The Pope is praying for all the displaced people, especially children, who have lost their homes, and adds that the Pope is saddened by the destruction and suffering. Some 100,000 people have been evacuated from their homes and an estimated 2,500 buildings destroyed. Officials warn that it could be months before the fire is brought under control. This past Sunday, displaced Catholics who've evacuated from the Fort McMurray area gathered together for a celebration of the Holy Mass, celebrated by St. Paul Bishop Paul Terrio at Edmonton's Resurrection Church. It was a teacher from a Catholic school who was able to pull the group together via email. The email addresses were on her laptop, the only thing she managed to grab before the evacuation. The community came together in prayer, remembering that even in the midst of disaster, our hope is in Christ. Coming up next, we'll take an up-close look at the church in Lithuania with Bishop Kestius Kevalas, who spoke to Voice of the Vatican about the life of the church in that country 25 years after the fall of communism. And on the 25th anniversary of the attempted assassination of Pope St. John Paul II, we take a look back on the events of that tragic day. And on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, we'll celebrate our faith with an unusual story of how this beautiful statue of Our Lady ended up in an unlikely place in Rome's Municipal Office of Sanitation. But first, as we prepare our hearts for the Feast of Pentecost, we shift focus to Kerala, India, to the Divine Retreat Center. That is the largest Catholic retreat center in the world. The Divine Retreat Center is celebrating its Silver Jubilee, and during its 25 years of life, over 10 million pilgrims from all over the world have attended retreats at the center. The aim is to renew not only the lives of individuals in the Holy Spirit, but to renew the entire church through His power and grace. Since its humble beginning, the center has now spread its wings and opened centers in the United States, Toronto, the UK, Australia, and five centers in Africa. We spoke to Father Augustin Valorin, the Director of English and Other Language Retreats at the center, to share some words of wisdom just in time for the feast. As we are preparing ourselves to celebrate the great feast of Pentecost, I have a great vision sitting in the Divine Retreat Center that the whole church, the whole humankind may be united in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. People of all cultures and nations gathered in Jerusalem proclaiming Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Today, there are many divisions in the world. There are many problems we are facing. There is so much of violence among nations, but the peace of Pentecost, the peace of the Holy Spirit should descend into us and spread all over the world so that this world may become the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the righteousness, peace and joy of the Holy Spirit. Teach everything he commanded them to teach. New ways to communicate God's word. 
present positive images to our people. This message of truth and salvation. Culture of uh, encounter. Gospel of Christ worldwide. Shalom World TV. Twenty four seven. Faith filled. Dynamic. Virtue building. Commercial free. Family friendly. Catholic charismatic channel to the whole world. Promote the gift of church teaching. Dedicated for the new evangelization. Mentor the young into a deeper embrace of the Catholic faith. Wonderful contributions to the church. People of prayer. Attractive people, attractive messages. Peace of Christ. Promote the values of life. This is media at its very best. The voice of the church. great love. Taking this to the next step. Shalom World TV. Shalom. 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 Shalom World. God's own channel. This week, Cardinal Secretary of State Pietro Parolin, as papal legate, attended the National Congress of Mercy in Vilnius, Lithuania. The Congress was the first of its kind in Lithuania's history and was the largest of the Jubilee events in that country. Among the festivities, Cardinal Parolin celebrated Mass at the Hill of Crosses, which was declared by St. John Paul II during his 1993 pilgrimage there as a place of hope, peace, love, and sacrifice. The Cardinal also celebrated Mass in the Cathedral of Saints Sanislaus and St. Ladislaus, and during his homily spoke about the universal call to be agents of forgiveness to each other. The gift of God's mercy is also a gift to be shared with others. In this regard, I am reminded of what Pope John Paul II said to the Lithuanian clergy when he met them here in the cathedral in 1993. After acknowledging the sufferings of the Catholic community during the previous decades, he urged the priests, in particular, to be good Samaritans towards their brothers and sisters, who continued to bear the burden of a past dominated by suspicion and accusation, the weight of the long years of the silence of God. Pope Francis also evokes the example of the Good Samaritan, urging us to practice the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which are the hallmarks of the Christian life. The Cardinal recalled that the message of God's mercy has particular associations with the city because it was right there that the first image of divine mercy was painted by artist Eugenius Kazmierowski. In honor of the National Congress of Mercy, Voice of the Vatican spoke to Bishop Kestius Kevalos, Auxiliary Bishop of Conus, Lithuania, to discuss what that image of divine mercy means to the Church of Lithuania. This year is very special for whole church, Jubilee year. Divine Mercy, and it's so nice that Lithuania is the first country who celebrated, you know, Divine Mercy Sunday in 1934 in Vilnius, in the presence of uh, this picture, which was painted in Vilnius, and Faustina was participating in the crowd during the Mass, saw a vision that raised 
from that picture go through the from the open heart of Jesus to Vilnius and to all the world. And you know, and suddenly when we see this happening right now in the world, we are astounded by the prophecy, you know, which is recorded in Faustina's diary. You know, I want you know, to embrace the whole world with this message. About 79% of the country of Lithuania is Catholic, yet unfortunately those numbers are not reflected in weekly mass attendance. In addition, both unemployment and taxes are high, which encourage the most qualified to leave the country to seek other opportunities. Bishop Kevalas shared with Voice of the Vatican a picture of the reality of the church in a country that's still dealing with the effects of communism only 25 years after its fall. Lithuania is uh, 3 million people, 80% of them are baptized in Catholic Church, so we uh, consider as a Catholic nation. But you know, it's a lot of people are nominal Catholics, they don't practice faith so much, you know, daily uh, mass goers is few, and you know, those who are coming on Sundays, perhaps 10-15% of all Catholic population, but uh, struggles uh, as in whole Europe, you know, society becomes secularized, you know, questioning these uh, principles the church taught, you know, for a thousand years. So we have uh, challenges to, per, um, to perceive the message, to give the message to the people in their own language right now, but hope that People, especially young, you know, they are open. They are, how to say, coming to World Youth Day, coming in our events. So we have movements of Christians, young Christians, who have big hope that they one day they will take part in leadership of the country and maybe they will be influencing the culture itself. Strong leadership like that of Bishop Kevalos will certainly help to nurture the growth of the Catholic Church in Lithuania. You can watch more of that exclusive interview with Bishop Kevalos at www.shalomworldtv.org slash vov. It was on the 13th of May of 1981 that two bullets rang out in St. Peter's Square during a public papal audience. Both of those bullets struck Pope John Paul II as he passed through the crowd in an open vehicle. His would-be assassin, a Turkish man named Mehmet Aliaka, was caught immediately and incarcerated and in an Italian prison. After the Holy Father recovered, he visited Aliaka and the two spoke in private and the Pope forgave him. Because the shooting occurred on May 13th, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, Pope John Paul II felt that it was through the intercession of Our Lady that his life was saved. Later, the Holy Father took the one bullet that had been retrieved from his body and made a pilgrimage to Fatima, placing it in the crown of Our Lady there. Then, during the great jubilee of the year 2000, Pope John Paul II requested that his would-be assassin was freed. As the Holy Father had written the year before the shooting in his encyclical entitled Rich in Mercy, forgiveness demonstrates the presence in the world of the love which is more powerful than sin. As we celebrate the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, we remember how Our Lady promised three shepherd children that the gift of her rosary leads to the gift of peace. Between May 13th and October 13th of the year 1917, three Portuguese children, now Blessed Francisco and Jacinta Marto, and their cousin Lucia dos Santo, received apparitions of Our Lady near Fatima, Portugal. During these apparitions, Mary asked the children to pray the rosary for world peace, for the end of World War I, for the conversion of sinners and the conversion of Russia. Next year, 2017, will be 100 years of Our Lady of Fatima. And in Fatima, Our Lady foresaw, Our Lady foresaw that Russia would spread her errors throughout the world, not only communism, socialism, but also abortion, because Russia was the first country in the world to legalize abortion. As a result, uh, with Fatima next year, 
it will be an occasion to ask the Holy Father, to ask the bishops of the world to fulfill the request she made and make an explicit consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart. Mention the word Russia. That's what she asked us to do. And to promote the devotion of reparation of the first five Saturdays. Reparation to ask God's forgiveness for the sins of our nations, for the sins of our parliaments, for the sins of our congresses and politicians who legalize who legalize murder, who approve legislation that go against nature, against the future of mankind. So then we hope that with Fatima, Our Lady will triumph as she promised in the end. Our Lady is beloved throughout the world, and the shrine at Fatima remains a popular devotional spot for Catholics. Not long ago, and right here in Rome, Our Lady of Fatima also made an appearance of sorts in another unlikely of places. We went to the AMA office, that is the Municipal Office of Sanitation Workers of the City of Rome, to find out more. Perché la Madonna a noi ci vuole bene, perché già era venuta nel, mille, nel 2012 qui, il 21 di maggio. The Madonna came to be here because she loves us. Back in 2012, on the 21st of May, the statue of Our Lady of Fatima visited various places in Rome. The statue also came here to the sanitation office and spent about two hours with us. I like to think that she saw the love with which we welcomed her then and wanted to come back and to share her love with us. Only a year and a half later, on October 12th of 2013, a tall man, a taxi driver, entered our sanitation office with a long box. He said that he had something to leave with us. My colleagues opened the box and found a statue of Our Lady of Fatima inside. While they looked and were marveling at her beauty, the man left. So even to this day, we have never known who he was, where the statue came from, or why he brought it to us. We discovered that the statue was broken, the hands were broken off, and it had some cracks. I found her hands inside of the box, and so I worked diligently on the repairs. I found that the statue's hands were not meant to be folded in prayer, but were open, just as Lucia recounted that the lady opened her hands and streamed a light on the children, which allowed them to see themselves in God's love. After the statue was repaired, I wanted to give a special gift to Our Lady to say thank you for coming to us. So I gave her the crown. On May 13th, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima of 2013, Cardinal Angelo Comastri, the Archpriest of St. Peter's Basilica, came here and blessed the statue and celebrated Mass in our office. You can imagine my joy that Our Lady of Fatima has chosen to come and stay with us here. And that statue continues to bring joy to all who visit the AMA office in Rome. All week long, you can keep up with the latest happenings in Rome on our Twitter feed, which is at Voice of Vatican. And be sure to like us on Facebook on our Voice of the Vatican page. Keep checking our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice, too. Email your questions, stories, and news to us at vov at shalomworld.org. This is Ashley Norona, and on behalf of the entire staff and crew of Voice of the Vatican, we wish you a blessed Feast of Pentecost. Saying ciao for now from the Eternal City, may God bless you and your family. I'll see you next week on Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV, from Rome to your home.